This chapter covers two very important decades, the 60s and the 70s. There's a lot of information to cover, so let's get to it. The posters on this slide are from 1966 and 1967, and they exemplify what the 60s became about. Hope, change, and war. And when we say war, we predominantly mean anti-war, because we're talking about the Vietnam War, and we'll get more in-depth into that as we go through this chapter. So we start to see the shift in American culture and a shift in the American promise. We see that expanding, and it expands to women and ethnic groups who start actually striving for equality. And we also have, during this period, the assassinations of John Kennedy, his brother Robert Kennedy, Kennedy, excuse me, and Martin Luther King, those three assassinations show just how tumultuous this strive for civil rights really was. And it also shows that not everyone supported the civil rights movement. He appealed to young idealistic voters and he started drawing in people who maybe hadn't even voted before because he had this kind of new approach to things. He was a young guy and he was pro-civil rights. He also started a Peace Corps which helped the sick and poor of third world nations and that appealed to the idealistic voter, the young people who wanted to get out and make a difference in the world. JFK had been in that situation himself. He remember being young and wanting to make a difference. And so he wanted to provide a means for young people to make a difference. That's where the Peace Corps came in. So in terms of Kennedy's foreign policy when he served as president, he strove to increase the military power of the country. Now during his campaign, he said that Eisenhower allowed a missile gap to develop between the U.S. and the Soviet Union which really played up the tensions of the Cold War, and it really put Americans on edge. But after taking office, he discovered that that gap really didn't exist at all. Uh, when he discovered it, and he had to cover the fact that he got it wrong, he said that he was wrong, but what did happen was that Eisenhower stockpiled hydrogen bombs, but failed to build enough conventional weapons. So, to be clear, he's admitting that the nuclear gap was not uh, there like he thought it was during the campaign, but he said that there were not enough conventional weapons. So basically, he said that Eisenhower got the United States into a situation where our only response to any kind of conflict would have been nuclear, which meant we could have ended chunks of civilization through any kind of nuclear uh, protest that we might have had. So there were some early tests during JFK's presidency. One was the Bay of Pigs, which was actually conceived by Eisenhower but enacted by Kennedy based on CIA information. And I've got a little video for you to watch about that that will be included in just a moment. So we'll leave that for you to see. But um, this became, obviously, an office fiasco for JFK, something he had to overcome as president. Administration. What happened was the Soviets had put nuclear missiles and troops in Cuba. Uh, the Soviets in Cuba were allies. And these missiles were medium range. So from Cuba, they could have hit Washington, D.C. and New York. And they also had short-range missiles there that could destroy American troops on Cuban beaches. The U.S. responded to that by putting missiles in Turkey, and they set up a blockade to stop Russian ships carrying missiles. Khrushchev said that Russia would stop sending missiles if the U.S. agreed not to attack Cuba, and they also said they would remove Cuban missiles if the U.S. would remove Turkey missiles. But um, that's not exactly what came out at the time, and the next video will explain that a little more to you. Ultimately, Kennedy agreed not to attack Cuba if the missiles were taken down, and then privately promised that the missiles in Turkey would be removed. <laughs> 
He didn't do that publicly for fear of looking weak. To Laos, Cambodia, and South Korea to help resist communist takeover. Kennedy and Eisenhower both had containment policies regarding communism, but Kennedy, however, was willing to send money and troops plus, plus supplies needed in order to fight communist takeover. During his time, he was not universally well-liked. The people in the South and the Southwest who were on the far right, very conservative, really despised his liberal views on civil rights. You know, um, that, was, that was a deal breaker for them. The left said he was too conservative and cold. So he was trying to find some middle ground. That's actually why he was in Dallas when he was assassinated. He went to Dallas to try to build relationships with the American public who had distanced themselves from him because of his view on civil rights. Now, this trip to Dallas is something that security warned him against because Adlai Stevenson had gone there for campaigning and had been spit on in Dallas. But Kennedy felt like it was important to him or for him to build those relationships, so they took that trip to Dallas. 4% annually, and anytime you have a growth, it's good. The average income rose by 48% from 1960 to 1970. And we had both domestic and exports for manufacturing markets. All jobs were in the U.S. There was no outsourcing at this time. You know, American-made was not novel then. It was, the, it was the norm. Unions were also strong. And if you had family members who lived in Malvern back in the 60s or 70s, Chances are that um, they worked at Reynolds or one of the other factories in the area, maybe the, one of the brick plants, maybe Acme. And, um, but I know especially at the um, Reynolds plants in Jones Mill that the unions there were very strong and bargained and negotiated for the benefit of their employees. Near the end of the decade, prices started to rise a little bit. That's called inflation. And we start seeing knowledge industries develop with people focusing more on science and scientific advantages. And part of that was because of Kennedy's dedication to space exploration. We'll talk about that in a minute. And um, also the impact of science and technology during this time period is that computers are actually starting to be built. We're learning about DNA at this time and better nutrition is available for people. So it makes people live longer and live healthier lives. To take over. Now, he had on his shoulders the responsibility of carrying out Kennedy's civil rights movements. And he worked hard to continue those in Kennedy's or after Kennedy's death. He also waged a war on poverty and created the Equal Opportunity Act through the Office of Economic Opportunity. And in order to fulfill Kennedy's dream of space exploration, in order to keep up with the Soviets, part of that Cold War, um, during Johnson's administration, the first manned moon landing took place. So it was important to him because he reached that goal for JFK. 59. This is a picture of astronaut Buzz Aldrin that was taken by astronaut Neil Armstrong. So if you look really closely in his helmet, you can see Armstrong's reflection in it as he's snapping the picture. Now, of course, there are some conspiracy theorists who contend that the moonwalk never happened. The moon landing did not occur. But if you enjoy the Adam Ruins Everything clips, do a quick Google search for Adam Ruins the Moon Landing and he shows exactly why it could not have been faked. Johnson's commitment to the civil rights movement and committed to commitment to racial justice led to the passage of the American Civil Rights Act of 1964. And with the passage of that act, we see more people getting involved and 
seeking judicial activism. There are several cases that are important that took place around this time. Uh, one of those is Mapp versus Ohio, and that case determined that evidence used in court can't be collected illegally. It has to be collected by procedure documented according to law. And in the course Gideon versus Rain Wainwright and Miranda versus Arizona, we determined that the accused have a right to a lawyer which ended up resulting in what we now know as the Miranda rights. You know, we see it on TV all the time. You have the right to remain silent. You have the right to um, an attorney. If you can't afford an attorney, one will be afforded for you. All of that stuff, the Miranda rights. And the case Engel versus Vital determined that there could be no prayer in public school. Now, that's no public prayer in public school. So no organized prayer would probably be a better way to word that. In the case Griswold versus Connecticut, they struck down state laws banning birth control. Then in Memoirs of a Woman of Pleasure versus Attorney General of Massachusetts, ultimately that lifted the ban on obscenity. So the state of Massachusetts claimed that this Memoirs of a Woman of Pleasure was obscene. The Massachusetts Massachusetts Supreme Court upheld that ruling, but the U.S. Supreme Court turned it over based on the First Amendment freedom of expression. This book was originally published in the mid-1700s, so, you know, we're looking at it quite a long time later by this point. So, anyway, originally written in the mid-1700s, it's often referred to as the first pornographic novel, so it was erotica. And ironically, it doesn't use any foul language at all, but it's full of euphemism that was, you know, determined to be obscene in some situations. However, the Supreme Court said that's freedom of expression. About the civil rights movement, and I've included a couple of people here. Normally, we talk about Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., who obviously was vital in the civil rights movement. He differed from Malcolm X in the way that King wanted to lead through um, peaceable protest. But Malcolm X said, you know, sometimes you got to get rough. Sometimes you got to get physical. So a big difference in the way that those leaders led their movements. So Dr. Martin Luther King, um, we, we know about him. Here, I think... Two of the people that we don't really discuss enough, and obviously we don't have enough time to do it here in this you know, combined chapter either, but two important people during this dissension in the 60s were Malcolm X and Elijah Muhammad. So Malcolm X was a spokesman for the black Muslims. He'd actually converted to Islam in prison. And Elijah Muhammad was of the black Muslims. His goal was to solidify black pride and the racial superiority of African Americans. And then also in terms of dissent, we have lots of other groups who are standing up for themselves, many for the first time. We have students who are standing up for their beliefs. We have women standing up for their beliefs. And we know that this has happened for women periodically because, you know, the suffrage movement and them gaining the right to vote in the early 1900s. So women are accustomed to making strides, as are African Americans, uh, out of emancipation and then the years through uh, the Jim Crow South and eventually to the Civil Rights Movement. But now we have the uh, LGBTQ groups standing up for themselves and Latinos, and Native Americans, other races, people are starting to take notice of activism and they're starting to take up for themselves. Because there were students there, they were exploring the opportunities of being away from home for the first time and taking care of themselves and, and learning things on their own, kind of putting themselves into the world and learning how they felt about it. So college campuses were a natural place for activist groups to begin. And at this time, we start seeing the embracement of counterculture. And that basically means doing the opposite 
of whatever culture has been laid before you. So kind of resulted in this new left in politics too. So in terms of hippies, you know, the hippie counterculture showed contempt for middle class mainstream values. They wore tattered jeans, they wore sandals, they wore beads, um, they developed a new language like groovy and can you dig it, that sort of thing. And material possessions were seen as fetishes. Also part of the counterculture was that sexual values were changing. So counterculture was open with nudity and sex and communes, you know, large areas of people who work together in a living situation. Communes included sex sharing and cohabitation without marriage became normalized. Also during this time period, X-rated movies become permitted. It becomes more accepted. You know, definitely not an easy time for homosexuals and um, we'll talk a little bit about different problems facing different groups like homosexuals during the 60s but it becomes more accepted and like I said people are starting to stand up for themselves more so the LGBTQ group as itself starts to really um, speak up for themselves and engage in activism. Also part of the counterculture of the 60s were mood altering drugs like LSD which was uh, brought forth by Timothy Leary. The drug culture extended beyond hippiedom. Also part of counterculture was music, like acid rock. Woodstock, which was a large outdoor concert, I'm sure you've all heard of it, was held in August 1969, and it included, in addition to days and days of incredible music, it also offered open sex and drugs. The art was psychedelic, and 1967 was declared the Summer of Love, and it was celebrated in San Francisco and in East Village, New York. When culture was adopted by the masses, the hippies felt like it was tainted. So, um, you know how trends catch on, right? So the hippiness, or hippiedom, as you want to call it, um, those things, those jeans, the ripped jeans and all that stuff, and you know, everything that they wore, kind of an early version of grunge look, if you will. When that started to catch on fashion-wise, the hippies felt like they'd been cheated, you know. So anyway, they felt like their culture had been tainted at that point. And just a few facts about Native Americans during this time period. Native American activists, including urban dwellers, were frustrated by the decades of poverty and discrimination that they'd faced. So whether they were living on a reservation or if they were living in cities, they still faced this same discrimination, and they were tired of it. So they formed organization to start uh, trying to make accomplishments to improve their lives. The average life expectancy at this time period in the 1960s of Native Americans was 46 years old. The, na the national average at that time was 69 the uh, Native American suicide rate was twice that of the general population, and the infant mortality rate was the highest in the nation. Now, half of the Native Americans lived on reservations, and employment there was 50, or unemployment there was 50 percent. Twenty percent of Native Americans living in cities were below poverty line, so even if they um, did have jobs, they were living well below poverty level, and. On November 20th, 1969, a small group of Native American activists landed on Alcatraz Island, which was the former site of a notorious federal prison in San Francisco Bay. They announced plans to build an American Indian culture center, including a history museum, an ecology center, and a spiritual sanctuary. People on the mainland provided supplies by boat, and celebrities even visited Alcatraz to help publicize the cause. More people joined the occupiers until at one point they numbered about 400. From the beginning, the federal government negotiated with them to persuade them to leave. They were reluctant at first, but over time the occupiers began to drift away of their own accord. Government forces removed the final holdouts on June 11, 1971, 
19 months after their occupation of the island began. The 50s changed to liberation in the 1960s. The National Organization of Women, or NOW, was a moderate voice for feminism, and it addressed patriarchy as the source of oppression. Also at this time, I've mentioned that the gay rights movement emerged, and different organizations were formed for support. In 1969, there was a raid of Stonewall Inn, which was a gay bar in New York's Greenwich Village. So gay bars at this point in time were accustomed to being raided, but this time the people inside fought back against the raid. They stood up for their rights, and a whole movement was created at that point. I step back just a few years, back into the mid-60s, when Johnson is still president, to talk about the Tonkin Resolution. The Tonkin Resolution in 1964 allowed the president to take all measures needed to repel any armed attack against forces of the United States. So Johnson saw this as an ability to pretty much declare war and um, protest against the Vietnam War included college students, pacifist groups, and peace organizations. Senator William Fulbright of Arkansas chaired the Senate Foreign Relations Committee and held televised hearings about the war, calling it a display of arrogance of power. So this decision to enter the war was not a popular one. The liberal radical clergy demanded an end to war, and um, Martin Luther King, we spoke briefly about before in 1967, called for an end to the war. Most Americans supported the war based on what they were told about it. Most Americans supported the war. Okay, let's jump now into the 1968 election. There's a lot going on here, so I'm going to try to sum it up for you. LBJ is president, Lyndon Johnson. Lyndon Johnson is president. He's running for re-election in 68. Things aren't going well for him. People don't like the Vietnam War. So the supporters that he had in 1964 when he ran have pretty much fallen out from under him. So Senator Eugene McCarthy from Minnesota decides to run for president against him. Even at that time, Johnson still had more support than McCarthy. But as the Vietnam War continued to play out on the TV screens of Americans in the evening news, things changed and got worse for Johnson. And one night, there was a trusted newsman named Walter Cronkite. And Cronkite predicted that the war in Vietnam was just a war that couldn't be won. And at that point, Humphrey was not likely to ever be able to gain enough momentum to win re-election. So that's when Robert Kennedy, or Bobby, Bobby Kennedy, threw his hat into the ring for the nomination. So now at this point, we have McCarthy, we have Robert Kennedy, and we have Johnson running for president. Things get so bad, though, after Walter Cronkite made that announcement and after Bobby Kennedy joined that Johnson said, you know, this is just going to split the party too much. And uh, so he withdrew from uh, seeking re-election. So then it's down to McCarthy and Kennedy. Um, but LBJ encourages his vice president, Hubert Humphrey, to run for president, and so he does. In the meantime, Martin Luther King Jr. is assassinated during this campaign period, as is Robert Kennedy, JFK's younger brother. So he is taken out of consideration for the office of president at that point. And Hubert Humphrey actually wins the Democratic Party's nomination to run for president. And he will be running against Richard Nixon, who was the Republican candidate for president. So, there's a lot going on in the 1968 election. So Nixon has a couple of different campaign strategies. One is 
he wants to let the South desegregate at their own pace. He doesn't want to force anything. He wants, you know, case of Ross or Raw, let it happen when it happens, that sort of thing. And so for that reason, the South loved him. He also talked about the silent majority, and he, um, he really campaigned hard toward them as a blue-collar worker. So these people were blue-collar worker, workers, factory-level workers, and he said that, you know, he called them the silent majority because they were the working class, the largest group in American society, yet he felt like their politicians weren't listening to their needs. And so he picked up a lot of support there. Then he picked Spiro Agnew as his vice president, and they fought their democratic challengers in the election of 1968 by calling them soft on communism. So these are the election results from the 1968 presidential election. You know, I mentioned to you that um, the majority of people loved Nixon, especially across the South, who would, you know, like his idea of letting them integrate whenever they felt like it. So you can see here on this map, though, that Nixon did not carry the states that we usually think of as Southern because they're right around us, you know, um, Arkansas, Louisiana, Mississippi, Alabama, and Georgia went for a third-party candidate named George Wallace, who had actually been the governor of Georgia. And he was what is known as a Dixiecrat, so very much Southern and very much a segregationist. So either between Nixon or Wallace, people who wanted to maintain um, kind of a status quo across the South, kind of had that summed up in either of those two candidates at that particular time in history. So I mentioned to you that one of the ways that Nixon campaigned for president was by appealing to the blue-collar worker. And in the 60s, there was nothing more blue-collar than a bowling night. And this picture shows Nixon bowling. So uh, people find ways to appeal to their constituents when they're running for office. But um, during the Nixon presidency, he was the first U.S. president to visit China after the communist victory in their 1949 Civil War. He also started this process of Vietnamization, which was turning over more control by the United States to South Vietnam and to train them to use weapons and to provide them with the weapons, not so much the troops. So in this way, he's finding a way to get people fighters out of Vietnam. Now, he also, however, authorized the bombing of Cambodia, which had been declared neutral territory. And again, mentioned the silent majority, the northern blue-collar workers that Nixon sell, said their voices were seldom heard. He continued appealing to them throughout his presidency. And what's a presidency without some scandal? That's where the Pentagon Papers come in. These documents were published in the media in June 1971. They were excerpts from a prepared study for the Johnson administration that revealed the true nature of the Vietnam conflict. The U.S. had been planning to oust the South Vietnamese leader, and they provoked North Vietnam attacks to justify escalating U.S. involvement in the South. So basically, um, they antagonized the North to get them to attack the South, so we would have a good reason to be there. Copies of this report were given to the media, including the New York Times. Now, Nixon's Attorney General, John Mitchell, sought an injunction against the New York Times to prevent further publication of articles about the topic. The newspaper appealed that lawsuit and the Supreme Court found in their favor. They said that the federal government could not prevent publication of the articles based on the First Amendment freedom of speech right. So the Pentagon Papers were released in 1971 and Nixon was up for re-election in 1972. So he's got the scandal to deal with as things come up. But now at this point, you know, that scandal particularly looks bad for the Johnson administration 
a little less bad for Nixon. So, he's going to face a Democratic challenger in the election of 1972. And um, he actually faced George McGovern as the Democratic nominee. But George McGovern wasn't the only one running. Uh, Shirley Chisholm ran for president. She actually ran for the Democratic presidential nomination after being elected as the first African-American woman in the U.S. House of Representatives just four years before in 1968. However, despite the fact that McGovern turned a lot of voters against him because he supported the women's right to abortion and decriminalization of drug use, he still beat Chisholm for nomination by the Democratic Party. So Nixon realizes at this point the war has got to end, but pulling out too suddenly could seem like an admission of failure of some sort. So he used his good relationship with China and the Soviet Union, and those two countries worked together to convince North Vietnam to use restraint. And Nixon overwhelmingly won the popular vote at home for getting those troops out of the Vietnam War. And it's pretty easy to see by this map that Nixon won re-election by a landslide in 1972. He even carried those southern states that he didn't win before, Arkansas, Louisiana, Mississippi, Alabama, and Georgia. Uh, only the blue states there cast their votes for George McGovern. And this slide shows both Nixon and Ford here because Nixon was elected president, um, president number 37, and Ford would be number 38. We'll talk a little more about him in a few minutes. So as the election map showed from 1972, the American public clearly loved Nixon. However, he wasn't able to make it through his entire second term because of a scandal known as Watergate. During his presidential campaign, there was a Committee to Re-Elect the President. The acronym for that was CREEP. They played dirty tricks on Nixon's opponents. They did things like rela releasing fake news to the press. They spied on opponents. They posed as campaign crew for the Democrats and scheduled rallies and bought materials and charged it to them, ordered materials, I should say, and charged it to them, and then, of course, these people didn't pay for them because they didn't order them, really. So it really gave the Democratic candidates a bad name. They also broke into the Democratic National Committee headquarters in Washington, D.C. to bug the headquarters so they could hear, find out what's going on, what the Democratic National Committee is planning. Very quickly, investigators tied creep back to the CIA and to the White House, and investigators subpoenaed the recordings from Nixon's office, but he refused to give them up, citing executive privilege. Nixon had a um, recording device in his office that was voice activated, so any time a president talked, the um, audio was recorded. Now, Nixon didn't have that put in, but it was there, and it caught everything he ever said in the office. As the investigation continued, the Supreme Court ordered Nixon to turn over those tapes, and they eventually revealed that he knew about the break-in and the bugging of the Democratic National Committee. The House voted to pass three out of five impeachment claims against the president. So, on August 5th, 1974, Nixon blamed poor memory on, you know, forgetting that he knew about the bugging and the break-in, but he accepted all the blame for Watergate. He said, you know, it happened under, under his watchful eye and on his watch, so he took blame for it. The Senate told him that they were planning to also vote for impeachment, so on August 8, 1974, Nixon resigned because he wanted to resign instead of having the Senate remove him from office. So that resignation took place the very next day, and Vice President Gerald Ford then was sworn in to fill out the term as president. 
So Ford was the first person to ever become appointed and then sworn in. So what that means is, you know, when Nixon's vice president, Spiro Agnew, resigned, then Nixon appointed Ford to serve as vice president. So with Nixon's resignation then, Ford, who was appointed to vice, to vice president, then became president. Anyway, that was a first. And one of the things he did right away, Gerald Ford issued a full pardon to Nixon, which really hurt any chance he might have ever had to get reelected again. And just on a cultural note, the gate is still used a lot today. Um, one of the last ones I can think of is inflate gate, you know, with the Super Bowl and, you know, where the football's inflated to the proper level. So when it comes time for the election of 1976, President Ford gets the Republican Party nomination and Jimmy Carter, a peanut farmer and governor of Georgia, wins the Democratic Party's nomination. He eventually wins the office of president altogether because he runs on the fact that he's a Washington outsider, that he's just a simple guy. He's a, a religious good guy, a family man. He had been an engineer, a peanut farmer, and was a former Navy officer. Carter said that Vietnam was bad for our country because it was contrary to what the country's moral values were. And a lot of his presidency focused on moral values, as did his life. Um, in terms of foreign affairs, Carter tended to focus on peace and human rights. He had achievements in negotiating peace talks between Egypt and Israel that resulted in a historic peace treaty in 1979. Now, he made one unpopular decision, uh, not to send athletes to the 1980 Summer Olympics because of the Soviet Union's invasion of Afghanistan. And he encouraged other countries to join in the boycott, but very few did. The hostage crisis that occurred during Carter's administration hurt his chance for re-election. On November 4, 1979, a group of Iranian activists stormed the American embassy in Tehran and took 66 em embassy employees. Now, they quickly released the women and the African Americans, but they ended up keeping 53 men. One of those was eventually released because he was so sick. So they kept 52 men. These activists were angered by the U.S.'s support for their unpopular Shah. They overthrew the Shah and they attacked the embassy. Carter's inability to handle this crisis cost him his re-election in 1980. The hostages were finally released on January 20th, 1981, as Reagan took the oath of office as president. And I just wanted to make sure that we touch base on three extra terms that I'd like for you to know because we just didn't fit them into the narration throughout the slides. Uh, one of these is Deep Throat. Deep Throat was the anonymous source that was later revealed, and when I say later, I mean much later, revealed to be Associate Director of the FBI, Mark Felt, who supplied reporters Bob Woodward and Carl Bernstein with information about the White House involvement in the Watergate break-in. Another term to know, Dixiecrat. A Dixiecrat was a Southern conservative Democrat who opposed integration and other goals of the African American Civil Rights Movement. George McGovern was one of those Dixiecrats, even though the party that he ran under was the American Independent Party. And lastly, executive privilege. Nixon did not turn over his subpoenaed tapes because he cited executive privilege. And that means it was the right of the U.S. president to refuse subpoenas requiring him to disclose private communications on the grounds that it might interfere with the functioning of the executive branch of government.